Well, when Joe asked me to uh, take the opportunity to be able to preach this particular Sunday, I was uh, thinking about praying about what I would preach on. And recently I sent uh, to a, a text to a friend of mine regarding the situation that we're facing in the world today with all the virus situation going on and the challenges that we're facing in the church, particularly in relation to how we relate to one another within the body of Christ and focusing on the local church. And so this particular text was 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 all the way to 4, 5. And I was going to do an overview of that and then focus on the Word of God as it leads to particular one another's in the New Testament. But I realized it was like three or four messages. So as I thought and prayed some more and I had some time to do this, I realized I should focus on one. And so today, the text that we're going to be uh, emphasizing is John 15, 12 to 17. And I'll read that, pray, and then we'll get into the message today. John 15, starting at verse 12. This is the well-known passage as he begins this particular section of his teaching before he went to the cross about us abiding. So let us stand in reverence for the Lord whose word this is as I read through this passage. Starting at verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. No greater love has, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master's doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. So that whatever you ask of the father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. Let's pray. Lord, as we read through this passage, we see the impossibility of this in many ways. You know our hearts and the challenges that we face in being able to relate to those, not only those that are like us, but those that are quite unlike us. And yet in the body of Christ, you've drawn a diverse group of people together, even in local churches like Beacon. But Jesus made it clear that we are commanded to love one another. Help us to understand in practical terms, not only the basis for this, but also how this might be evident day by day in the days and weeks and months to come. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So as we work our way through this, this is not gonna be the standard six, three points. It's gonna be six. <laughs> So as I look at what the usual time for a message is, I realize that some of these points will have more emphasis than others, but I see that there are six aspects to this that are important for us to consider. First of all, we notice in verse 12, it's like a sandwich, really, the two buns, because verse 12 says, this is my commandment that you love one another. And then in verse 17, this I command you, that you love one another. So Jesus doesn't say, please love one another. He doesn't say I, that you, I'm begging you to love one another. I encourage you or ask you to love one another. Rather, he commands. Now what... The idea of this word is this. One man defines it as an order, charge, or precept. Another, it stresses the authority of the one commanding. 
Now, I want us to look at some of the scriptures and how often we see you love one another in the scriptures. Starting at John 14, verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Now, yes, it seems like there's frequently, John refers to this idea of love. And I want to read through some of the verses in 1 John. By this we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I've come to know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Verse four, or chapter 4, verse 21. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Chapter 5, verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and observe his commandments. Some time ago, I put together all the one another's in the New Testament as a list. The majority of those one another's, not the majority, but the one that's repeated the most is love one another. And I'm going to read some of the other verses where we find this. Just so you see how pervasive this is in Scripture. Romans 13, 8. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. Now, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13, although it doesn't mention one another here, it's clearly implied. But we request you, brethren, that, we, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. 2 Thessalonians 1.3 We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each of you toward one another grows ever greater. So that was Paul. Now Peter, 1 Peter 1.22 since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. Finally, oh, it's for Peter, 1 Peter 2.17, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God and honor the king. Finally, Hebrews 13.1, let love of the brethren continue. This is not an option. We don't have a choice with this. We must do this. If we're going to say that we know Christ, we desire to obey him and follow what he's commanded us, and that is to love one another. Now, the second point is how he explains what love is. Just as I have loved you. Love one another as Christ has loved us. He said this just earlier in chapter 13. The well-known passage, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. There he's giving a, a clear, evident outcome that will take place when this occurs, when this is evident, when this sh is shown. In Philippians chapter 2, this passage helps us and reminds us of the reality of what it means for Christ to have loved us. 
Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now what's interesting is, the previous two verses of Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4, is Paul instructing the Thessalonians about the attitude that they're to have towards one another. So he bases it on the verses that follow these two verses, in verses 3 and 4, on Christ becoming man and living a life that's service to others and then going, willing to be obedient to the Father to the point of death. So Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So we have, yes, the ultimate example, isn't it? And Jesus said that back here in this chapter, that we're to love like that. It's to be evident in us. It, the profound change that's occurred when we're given a new heart. The mind that's being renewed, as we will look at a little later. So love one another as Christ loved us, but also with the idea that Christ gave his life for us when we were sinners. Andrew mentioned that earlier, Romans 5, verses 6 to eight, uh, 10, says this. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Pardon me, starting at verse six, that was verse eight. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse nine, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we will be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. What struck me some time ago when I read through this passage was the four different words to describe what our condition was before we knew Christ. We're called helpless, some versions say useless, ungodly, sinners, and enemies. That's how the, who we were, and Christ died for us. And that's what Jesus is talking about here in this passage, about the fact that we're not picking and choosing who we're to love. This is a challenge for all of us. Because we like to be with the people that we get along with, people that have similar interests, the people that we identify with and they with us. One of the things that on and off I've prayed for is having close friends. It's a challenge to find close friends. As one book put it, there's lots of acquaintances we can have, but it's a challenge to have real friends. But the body of Christ should be fostering and can be developing that. The potential's there. The challenge that we face right now is the not being able to gather corporately, whether on a particular time, on one day of the week, like Sundays when we normally do, or even in smaller groups when we used to. Yeah, technology helps, but 
it doesn't substitute, and we know that. God is working in our minds through the Word of God. We will see that later on. Changing the mind changes the will, and emotions then follow. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave. See, love acts. Yes, we can meditate on it. We can sit at home and read through these verses and, and be profoundly impacted, and that's good. But Jesus is making clear here, you've got to act on it. I did, he says to them. You're to love like I did. And he's showing them, right? He, before this, he washed their feet. He demonstrated relationship with them and his oneness with the Father when he went off on his own on a regular basis. And he's been preparing them for what he's going to do ultimately with his death on the cross. You know what's interesting too? John 17, some time ago when I was reading through, and I'm going to read the first 10 verses of John 17, and notice how much the word gave is in these verses or has given in these first 10 verses. It's all the way through this, this prayer. And it, it's illustrating both the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Son and those that he's called to himself. So listen for the word gave. Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son, that the son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that you may know him, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now you have come to know, they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them, and they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you. They believed that you sent me. I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine. And I have been glorified in them. For God so loved the world that he gave. Acts. Love acts. So the explanation of love that Jesus gives here is we're to love as he loved us. Love as he gave his life for us when we were sinners. And it's sacrificial. Now, if you want to think about how challenging this is, read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. You can put yourself in here and see how you measure up. There's 15 different descriptors, eight that are negative and seven that are positive. Love is patient, love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I want to read to you a paraphrase that 
I put together simply a while ago of these uh, seven verses. But instead of having love in that verse, those verses, I substituted Jesus Christ. So listen to these verses. If I speak the t with the tongues of men and of angels and do not have Jesus Christ, I become a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have Jesus Christ, I'm nothing. And if I give my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned and do not have Jesus Christ, it profits me nothing. Jesus Christ is patient. Jesus Christ is kind and is not jealous. Jesus Christ does not brag and it, he is not arrogant. He does not act unbecomingly. He does not seek his own. He is not provoked. He does not take into account a wrong suffered. He does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but he rejoices with the truth. He bears all things. He believes all things. He hopes all things. He endures all things. Jesus Christ never fails. The foundation for love in this chapter isn't some generic love that everybody has. They just have to practice it. This is describing the Christian. And only the Christian has the capacity, the power, the enabling, which we will get to as Andrew did us teaching on the Holy Spirit. This is impossible for us. That's why Jesus can command it. So we've had the expectation. We've had the explanation. Now the extent to which we're to love one another. What does Jesus say here, John 15? Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friend. What's interesting is the love word used here in these first couple of verses is agapao, the verb, which really in many ways was developed and extended in, in the Christian context and understanding God loving the way he does. But the word friends here is related to the, another Greek word, phileo, Philos, so friends, right? It's love, but it's a love that's a relationship between people. That's like a tender affection, let's say, rather than unconditional love. So notice what Jesus says. He says, we are his friends since we obey him. You are my friends. And it goes on in verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Obedience and love are always joined. <laughs> There's going to be evidence of that. We can't just say we love him as I read in 1 John. We can't say we love him and don't obey him. It's not legalism. It's love expressed. Let me read uh, from a book here that Alexander Stroke, who wrote one of the better books on, what, on biblical eldership, he wrote a book called Love or Die, and he did, he's done teaching on his church in this. But I want to read a footnote. Speaking of the Trinity as a society of persons, Bruce Ware writes, God is never alone. The one God is three. He is by very nature both a unity of being while also existing eternally as a society of persons. He is socially related, a socially related being within himself. In this tri-personal relationship, the three persons love one another, support one another, assist one another, team with one another, honor one another, communicate with one another, and in everything respect and enjoy one another. Such is the richness and the fullness and the completion 
of the social relationship that exists in the Trinity. That's what our goal is, isn't it? It's expressed within the context of the Trinity itself. And that we're called to manifest that and show it in our love for those that are at Beacon Church. It's vital to remember that even though we communicate and connect with a variety of people, I'm sure we have friends in various places in the world because of the various tools that we have technologically right now. But we are to emphasize, stress, and commit to Beacon Church. We only have so much time and energy. And there's much that needs to be done, <laughs> both within our church and through our church. And the challenges, really, this is the heart of the message, the challenge that we face right now the lack of connectedness and ties and links and communication that takes place. We've got to rededicate ourselves. Let me read what James Boyce, who was, uh, shall I say, a Presbyterian preacher down in the States, very good teacher, preacher at a large church. There is something charming about the word friend or friendship. It is due partly to our desire for a close friend or friends and partly to our remembrance of them. We look to our past and can almost mark the major periods of our lives by the friends we've had. Perhaps at the point of going into high school, we made different friends. And we think sometimes not only of the friends, but of the adventures we had, sometimes adventures that the teachers and other authorities did not fully appreciate. We've had friends we acquired later in life. We value friendship and we know we would be much impoverished if we have no friends at all. It is this awareness that probably gives the verses to which we are now, we now come, to which we now come, their special appeal. For in them, the Lord Jesus Christ, the great incarnate God of the universe, speaks of friendship in terms of our relationship to him. He calls us friends, saying, Greater love is no man than this. He laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. And then he says, notice, no longer, verse 15, no longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing but I've called you friends for all things that I've heard from my father, I have made known to you. The ESV there uses the word servant. It's basically the same word, doulos. And so some translations put servant in, others use a slave. But notice what it says. I no longer call you a slave because the slave just does what he's told. He doesn't know what the master's reason is, purpose is, goal is, intent. Nothing's explained to him. But Jesus says that's not the case. I've been brought, brought you into a close relationship with me so I can call you friends. And one of the evidences of that is that I've told you what the father's told me. That's what he says in his high priestly prayer. What the words that you gave me, I've given to them. He's revealed them to us in God's word. That's why Beacon Church is committed to the word of God as the foundation for what we're doing. Otherwise, we're just guessing. We come up with our own thoughts and ideas about who God is. And there's a multiple opportunities to follow all kinds of different avenues and tracks, isn't there, today? So he's focusing on the Word of God. One of the most important verses for us to memorize is John 17, 17. You can memorize it right now. 
Sanctify them in truth, Jesus said. Sanctify them in truth, your word is truth. That's the entire verse. Jesus is praying to the Father, asking the Father to sanctify those that the Father had given to him. Continue his work of growing and maturing them. How? Through the word of God. That's why one of the foundational things when I work with men individually is what their personal walk with the Lord is, their time in the Word. I don't set specific parameters or, or particular rules and so on. I focus on consistency. But it's got to be. <laughs> it's got to be if we're going to be honest and faithful to serving the Lord. So I ask a question here in terms of applications. We go on, and those will take the bulk of the message, and we've got three others to highlight. But I'd like to ask, how well do you know people of Beacon beyond your regular weekly contacts? Not only those we like, not only those we enjoy being with, and not only those with the same interests. We're the body of Christ. All those that know Christ and are part of Beacon, and there are those that need to know Christ. And we need to know them, connect with them. And we'll talk more about that in the next three points. So we go on to number four here, my fourth point. At the first part of verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. So far, we've seen the expectation that Christ has to love one another as a command, the explanation, the extent. Now here's the enablement. He's chosen us to bear fruit. And that fruit, I believe the focus here is on loving one another. Now there's others interpret this idea of fruit with sharing the gospel and people coming to Christ. But I believe in this context, the focus is very much on loving one another. And that's the fruit that will be evident both in our growth, in the way in which we see we need to be obedient to what God's word says, to take initiative with people that we might not normally connect with, but also the fruit that would be born in their lives as they benefit from us connecting and supporting and encouraging and admonishing and rebuking, as we're told in 2 Timothy 3 and 4, chapter 4. It's the Holy Spirit that does the work, not us. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, but we have this treasure in, what does it say? What does that verse say? We have this treasure in earthen vessels. What treasure? Jesus, right? Okay, Jesus Christ is the treasure. Worthy earthen vessel. So that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. Ephesians 3.16, Paul's prayers for the Ephesians, at least one of his prayers recorded here, that he, Paul says to the Father, he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. That's how we live the Christian life, as a, in a broad context of daily, weekly, monthly living for the Lord, but specifically to be able to live like this. So we're loving one another like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it loved us. What's the first fruit of the Spirit? Yeah. Fruit of the Spirit 
is love. That's the kind of change that God's working in you and I. And the other fruit too, yes. So the enablement is by Christ so that we can bear fruit. And then the evidence of our obedience to one another. What's the evidence? That the fruit would remain. That's what he says. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. Abide. It's the same word as was mentioned earlier. Continues on. Not there for a fleeting moment or a short time, but continues to be evident because of the change that God has worked through the word of God in that person's life as each of us has ministered to them and they to us. Matthew 23, 13, in the midst of Jesus dealing with the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, in the midst of that, he says, he who endures to the end, he will be saved. See, that's the fruit. Yeah, people save, but they mature. They stand firm by the enabling of the Lord through the Spirit. One of my favorite verses, how can I say favorite? There's so many, but one of the ones that I particular think of often is Philippians 1.6. Therefore, Paul writes to the Philippians, I'm confident to this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. Isn't that an amazing promise? <laughs> uh, despite the ups and downs that we can face and the challenges and the uncertainties and even the humdrum routine of life, he will complete his work. God prunes, we saw that earlier in the chapter. If you look back, those that bear fruit, he prunes, so they'll produce more fruit. Okay, the last point here. That doesn't mean this is just a short little point, but my last point of the six, we did get here in a reasonable time. Example of ways to obey Christ's command to love one another. Recently, I came across, and forgive me for using the word podcast. Podcast. You can talk to me about that afterwards. A podcast that uh, this fellow that teaches at Master Seminary in uh, California he teaches biblical counseling, Stuart Scott. He's written a very good book called The Exemplary Husband. There's a study guide that goes along with it. And he also has taken a chapter out of that book like communication. So you can get a booklet that's just one chapter on that that talks about communication within marriage particularly. Anyways, he's written a book on the one another's in the Bible and they were interviewing him about it. And basically, there were three points that he said as a practical way to put it into praxis as far as loving one another. One of them was being creative. Now, some of us are probably more creative than others. Depends on the field and artistically or writing or it could be a whole variety of different things that we are creative in and yet the spirit thinking of creation is creative <laughs> and he can enable us to be creative in the midst of the challenges that we're facing right now as to how we can minister to one another in other words i can't just tell you what i think are good ideas because there could be ways that the Lord would have you do that I would never think of. 
is we spend time in the word, and we'll talk about as we conclude prayer, is the key to this. So that as you go from here, a practical step is asking the Lord creative ways to be able to continue to build relationships within Beacon Church. So creativity is one way. Another one is recognizing that if we're to love one another, it's going to be inconvenient. And I don't like that word. I want the structure. I want an order. I like to know what's next and when it's going to happen. And you can talk to my two daughters and my wife that when I remember when our grandkids were very young and our daughter would call and say, oh, I need we need some someone to help us. We, could you help us as far as taking care of the grandkids because of something going on? And I'm there. I prepared, I'm looking at this passage of scripture, or I'm preparing this message, or I'm doing whatever, and now they're asking me to do something different. And I had to work through that. I don't like inconvenient things. It's going to be inconvenient to our time. You know, I was thinking of doctors. If they're taking care of patients, maybe not so much now, but they'll get, they used to get calls at all times that they have to come in and deal with some issue that's arisen with their patient in the middle of the night. So it's going to be inconvenient and be prepared for that. That in itself is having to rely on the Lord's strength and enabling and power. And the last one is being intentional. And that is, this is where you do structure it in and plan it. Put it down on the calendar. I'm going to phone so-and-so on such and such a time. I want to meet with that person. Yes, you have to meet outside, but plan it. Go for a walk or whatever the idea you come up with. But be intentional. Creative, inconvenient, and intentional. Think of the 12 apostles, Jesus didn't pick 12 fishermen. No. If you read the list, they come from a variety of backgrounds. The fishermen would not have been mixing with Matthew, that's for sure, on the social scale or economic scale, possibly. One man wrote this simple comment. I love this comment. God's commitment to your fruit bearing is greater than your commitment to comfort. Let me read it again. God's commitment to your fruit bearing is greater than your commitment to comfort. Finally, as examples of ways to obey Christ's command to love one another, I want to read from this fellow, Barton Bruce, because he makes a very good point in relation to what comes after this in this chapter. He's talking about loving one another. We're his friends. We're chosen by him to bear fruit and so on. And then he says in verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. <laughs> that, that wouldn't be the typical way in which some kind of uh, speaker that's trying to get people engaged and involved and to go from what he just talked about, loving one another, to the world hating you. But it's the truth. And so Bart, this Barton Bruce says this, listen carefully, the verse, the verse 17, which says, this I command you that you love one another, capsulizes the theme that Jesus introduced in this verse, in verse 12, and yet also serves as a contrast for what follows. The disciples must love each other because they would take Jesus' message to a world that, would, that despised them. Christians get plenty of hatred from the world. From each other, we need love and support. 
Now listen to some of the words that he uses here. Jesus legislated love. He required his disciples to make peace with one another, to place the interests of others above their own, and to solve differences quickly. He knew they were diverse in background, but he ordered them to love each other. Jesus knew that setting this high standard was essential to preserve the unity of the church. If he required it, the believers would accept and live out this standard. Backbiting, disrespect, and bitterness towards fellow believers strips the church of its power. Particularly, not only within the church and it affecting its growth in relationships, but as a testimony. And one of the things that saddened me that I found, because I get communication from people that are on both sides of the idea of what's going on with this virus issue, those that think it's just about a hoax and those that think we've got to do everything possible that we're, we're told right down to the nth degree. And even some of the almost antagonism across the board towards each other. And that may have been part of what was the impetus behind this. The main one for me in terms of bringing this out today was recognizing the challenges we face as a church in our present context and how we can begin more and more to move ahead as a church despite these. So in this passage, we've looked at Christ's expectation as a command to love one another. We saw his explanation that we're to love as Christ loved the church, to love others knowing that they were sinners and enemies of God, but now, by God's grace, they're saved. They know Christ. They're one of his. They're fellow citizens of the saints. Sacrificial. That the extent to which it happens aren't just with those that we like and want to be with. It's through the word of God, the enablement of Christ through the spirit bears fruit through us and the evidence will be that the fruit remains and finally some of the examples were as scott pointed out to be creative inconvenient it will be inconvenient and intentional and finally remember this as a fellow named murray harris wrote obedience to jesus marks rather than makes jesus friends Let us pray. Lord, thank you for drawing us to yourself by your grace. You loved us and you gave us Jesus Christ. Born of a woman, born under the law. And he obeyed, took no initiative of his own, obeyed you throughout his entire life to the point of death on the cross and he was raised from the dead and he's alive today. Thank you that you're the one that will enable each of us as believers to seek you to know how we can minister step by step and in a reasonable and but effective way to one another in the body of Christ at Beacon. In Jesus' name, amen.